This meeting is being recorded. Afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to this meeting on the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code. I'm just going to wait a few seconds to get the, um, the participant room to populate. It takes a few minutes, a few seconds to make that happen. Uh, thank you all for joining us. All right, uh, afternoon and welcome to this meeting on the committee, committee on the revision of the penal code, which is now in session. I'm Michael Romano, the committee chair. This is our first meeting of 2023. I'd like to begin with a quick roll call of members in alphabetical order. Assembly member Brian. Here. Judge Espinoza. I'm here. Judge, Espin Judge Henderson is not here. Uh, Judge Moreno, Justice Moreno. Well, here. Senator Skinner. Here. Thank you. Uh, we have a busy agenda today as usual. In addition to the presentation from the California Policy Lab, uh, we'll also have a brief administrative update and legislative update, and we'll have time to discuss what we've heard today. We'll also take a break or two along the way, and we aim to be done by 5 p.m. Um, I'd like to begin with a quick administrative item, which is to approve the minutes of the November 19th, 2022 meeting. Will someone second approving the minutes? Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, without any opposition, I would like to approve the, the minutes for the November meeting. All right. With that done, um, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, we haven't met in a few uh, months, actually, and um, I just want to Tom to come on screen to give a brief uh, update on the bills that we have pending before the legislature that the committee and staff have been hard at work on. There are five bills in print. Uh, the, the legislature uh, in the legislature that are based on committee recommendations. Um, as always, we're looking closely with legislators, their staff, uh, to offer whatever technical assistance we can along the way, and we'll keep you posted along um, through the process. Tom, is there anything that you want to note or highlight? Well, uh, it's uh, three of them with Assemblymember Brian, so I don't know if he has anything he, he wants to add, but there may be more added to this eventually, as you said, Mike, these are just the ones that the language is out uh, in print right now. So these are all based on our recommendations. Uh, looks like all from our last uh, report, uh, in addition to uh, ongoing efforts that we have that we'll also discuss today. Uh, Senator Skinner, yeah. Um, uh, Senator Becker and I are, um, the language will be put across the desk very soon. The, uh, a bill that it reflects um, recommendations of the Committee on the Revision of Penal Code related to uh, parole, but also very much in sync with the LAO report that um, came out uh, um, in uh, a couple months ago on the parole process. So basically, it's a bill that would codify many of the LAO's recommendations, which have uh, a, a great deal of um, comparability to uh, our committee's recommendations. Yeah, that LAO report is, is I think, very useful, uh, let me put it that way. And, um, you know, I think that we've been talking about the parole system for quite a while, a number of different contexts. And it's, you know, I know it's something that's been on your agenda and something on this committee's agendas for a while it needs uh, real attention. Uh, Assembly member Brian. So just a, a quick but comprehensive update. Um, consent search is on the assembly floor. Uh, oh, great. Like the first bill eligible to be heard on the assembly floor. We're just doing our whip count um, the fact that the RIPA board matches our recommendation to limit uh, and or end the use of consent searches um, is extremely helpful. In addition, Highway Patrol has had this as their policy since 06. Um, and so we are in a really good position with that one. Restorative Justice Groups is the only one of the three that hasn't appeared before committee yet. Um, the language went in print today. I met with about 30 RJ groups right before I came here. Um, so there's a, a lot of good momentum there. And then arraignments has cleared the public safety committee. Uh, and we're in good shape there as well because Florida, um, Texas, and other places don't have any exemptions to their 48 hours. Oh, great. I should also mention that the governor just now, when, uh, is it San Quentin talking about restorative justice? Mm. Um, so um, I hope that there's a good momentum behind that idea. Absolutely. Thank you to the committee staff. Uh, Tom and others who have been working with with Kenny on my team and others, your efforts have been invaluable. So appreciate you. Here, here. All right. Any more questions about uh, ongoing legislation that's going in the Capitol right now? 
All right. Uh, today, actually, we're going to look back. Um, that's the the percent of our uh, meeting today. Um, and I think it's especially appropriate, as I mentioned, Governor Newsom is in San Quentin and just minutes ago announced a transformation, as they're calling it, of the incarceration throughout the prison system, um, starting with a new rehabilitation and restorative justice program at San Quentin. Today, our goal is to assess what effects the changes have had, changes to criminal law, if any, and determine what further changes the committee might recommend. We are now in the fourth year of the committee's work, and it seemed an appropriate time to check in on reforms that resulted not just from our work, but also from other, other reforms that share our goals of improving public safety and reducing unnecessary incarceration and improving equity in California. We're gonna cover a lot of ground today, so I wanted to give a high level overview of the laws that we're looking at. Staff has prepared a one page cheat sheet that you can find on the last page of our memo. Um, and I'm, I also wanted to just show a, a rough grade or of, of how each of the pieces of legislation um, that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we'll have a group that appears, Tom, do you wanna put this on this? Yeah. There so there's, I also wanna flag that um, people refer to these reforms in a number of different ways. Sometimes they're using the, the bill number, sometimes they refer to the penal code number, sometimes they refer to the, to the actual English words that apply to the statutes. So we're gonna to try to keep it consistent um, throughout the day. And if anybody has any questions to make sure we're talking apples to apples. But um, very quickly, um, and as this will, it should be clear in our uh, memo, staff memo, there are a number of laws that have been working fairly well, in fact, better in some ways than, than expected. Um, and these include the nickel priors, the narrowing of the gang enhancement, felony murder reform, and expansion of the community reentry programs, the MCRP. And we'll hear more about some of these today. Um, some of the bills, some of the proposals that we've worked on, I think need room to grow. Um, CDCR and prosecutorial initiated resentencing, which we'll hear about uh, today, and removal of the one and three year prior conviction enhancements um, also, I think, could use, use some improvement and some work. Um, the judicial discretion to uh, dismiss firearm enhancements, which was something also that we've looked at, seems to be underperforming as best we can tell. A lot of these, of course, are based on, um, you know, uh, the evidence that we have to date. Um, so, um, and there's a number more that we think that there's still more uh, time and data that we need to collect. So particularly judicial discretion to dismiss enhancements under uh, changes to, Penal Code 1385, uh, the presumptions on uh, determinate sentencing, and uh, the Racial Justice Act. So that's a very kind of rough grades, as we can tell so far, of the bills that we, the proposals that we have been particularly interested in following. Um, finally, I wanted to put California's experience in broader context. For more than a decade, there have been significant reforms to address some of the most extreme sentences in the state. From our counting, a little over 11,000 people have benefited from resentencing over the past 10 years. This, in people, this includes people who've been resentenced under Propositions 36, 47, changes to the felony murder law, resentencing referrals from CDCR and prosecutors, and people immediately eligible to have their one or three year prison priors removed under SB 483. And during this time, it's important to note that crime has largely dropped. While 11,000 is a large number, it's a fraction of the number who are people who are arrested, convicted of a felony and sent to prison during this time. By contrast, the, fel the federal prison system resentenced more than 35,000 people, three times as many people over a short amount, shorter amount of time. So while we have made progress in California, there seems to be much more that we can do. Uh, with that said, let's get started. Our first presentation today is from our research partners at the California Policy Lab, the researchers at CPL will preview a report on sentencing enhancements in California, including an overview on how some of the changes to sentencing laws that I just mentioned have affected the prison population. We'll have a few minutes of presentation and then Q&A for, commu for committee members. Uh, let me introduce the folks from CPL. We have uh, Molly Pickard. Hi, Molly. Uh, Omar Gill and Professor uh, Stephen Raphael. Uh, Ms. Pickard, will you take it away? Yes. Thank you. 
figure out how to share my screen. <laughs> Oh, it looks like it's disabled. All right, let me double check that. I thought I'd allowed it for everybody, but I'll take care of that. All right, give it a shot now, Molly. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Molly Pickard as... Uh, Mr. Romano just introduced, um, and we will be presenting on understanding sentence enhancements in California. Um, so as also which is mentioned, it's going to be a two part presentation first on a report that we will be releasing next week. Um, the report covers many topics related to sentence enhancements, uh, including the frequency of enhancement combinations, the frequency of use of specific enhancements, understanding the average time added from enhancements, plus a lot more. So please read that uh, next week when it comes out because it's very comprehensive. For this presentation, we're just going to go over a few key findings. And then the second half, we're going to look at enhancement policy reforms and changes in admissions to prison after those reforms took place. So we're going to start just with a very quick overview of what sentence enhancements are. So there are over 100 unique sentence, sentence enhancements in California, and that means there's over 100 unique opportunities for people to have their sentences lengthened past their base sentence. There are two main types of enhancements that are used, case, which is more commonly known as status, and offense, which is more commonly known as conduct. For this presentation and for our report, we call them case and offense because that's what it is referred to in the data. So for consistency, um, both in the report and here, we're just gonna continue to refer to them as case and offense, but just to make sure everyone understands, I'm referring to status and conduct enhancements. So case enhancements are applied based on an individual's prior criminal history or status and offense enhancements refer to a specific circumstance related to how the crime was committed or who the crime was committed against, such as when a gun is used in the commission of a felony or when uh, drugs are involved in a crime or things like that. Uh, I also wanna just note three strike sentencing. While it is its own sentencing scheme, we classify them under case enhancements just to help give a fuller picture of how enhancements are used or additional time is added in uh, sentencing in California. And then finally, I just want to note that enhancements are added to a base sentence and can run either consecutively or concurrently. So people can get multiple enhancements on their sentence and they can be uh, added consecutively so people can get many, many years added to a relatively short base sentence. So first we're gonna look at the sentence enhancement prevalence. And I wanna start just by talking about the two populations that we're gonna be looking at. We're looking at both admissions since 2015 to present. Um, that's just the date that we have the data from. So that's the time period we look at. And then we look at a snapshot from July of 2022. Um, and we use that date just because that was the most recent date when we started this analysis. Uh, well, we get uh, more up-to-date data regularly. And so future reports will look at more up-to-date data. But as we can see, admission since 2015 is uh, somewhat self-explanatory. It's just new people who are being admitted to prison in that time period. And then the snapshot has uh, more of an overview of who is currently in prison. So you're going to see more of the longer sentences, more LWAP, more of the extreme sentencing. And you can see that also here in sentence enhancement use. So roughly 40% of people admitted to prison since 2015 have at least one sentence enhancement. And nearly 70% of people in prison as of July 2022 have at least one sentence enhancement. And you can also see that it's much more heavily towards the five plus enhancement use for that July 2022 snapshot. Again, because we're looking at a population of people who that's the more extreme end of the sentencing. So next up, um, there are eight enhancements that account for over 80% of the sentence years added since 2015. We're only presenting 2015 um, to 2022 data here, but the snapshot is very similar. It's the same eight enhancements, essentially, just in a different order and with slightly different percentages. But those enhancements are the three strikes laws enhancements, so third and second strikes, uh, firearm enhancements, nickel prior, and gang enhancements. And these have added 466,700 years to people's sentences uh, since 2015. 
And the only notable difference between uh, this and the snapshot, I think, is that the third and second strike are switched. So for the, the July 2022 snapshot, third strike is up there with a much higher percentage leading the way. So next we looked at racial, ethnic, and sex disparities. Again, we have the two populations, the admissions on the left and the snapshot on the right. Sentence enhancements are more likely to be applied to men and to individuals from racial and ethnic minority groups. Black and American Indian people are more likely to receive enhanced sentences followed by Hispanic, white, and Asian people. And men are more likely to receive enhanced sentences relative to women. Just give you all a second to take that in. Um, and then last up for our key findings, we have uneven county distribution. So in this map, uh, you can see that the, on the lower end of enhancement use is the lighter blue tealy color, and then the higher use is the darker color. And so lowest rates in the Bay Area counties and Southern counties and coastal counties, and then there's highest rates among far Northern counties, the counties in the Central Valley and the Inland Empire counties. This um, is per 100,000? Yes, it's per arrest rate per 100,000. So it's important to note that variation exists across sentencing practices at every point in the criminal legal process. So it's not that surprising that there would also be a variation in enhancement use. Um, we didn't look specifically into the reasoning of this, but there are many reasons such as uh, variation in part due to the prevalence of the severity of types of crimes that are committed in certain counties or differences in the discretion by judges and prosecutors in the application of enhancements, um, among other things. But again, uh, we didn't look into that. We're just showing the, the rough trends. So now I will hand it over to my colleague, Omer, who will look at enhancement policy reforms and the impact they've had on the the admissions population. Thanks, Molly. So from about 1980 up until 2000, we see numerous enhancements were created in California, including three strikes, nickel prior, gang enhancements, and the 1020 life gun enhancement. And these are some of the blue bubbles on this timeline. And starting in 2012, there have been a number of reforms to either restrict the usage of sentence enhancements or eliminate them completely. And these are some of the green bubbles on the timeline. And so in the next couple of slides, we're going to highlight three policy reforms to enhancements in recent years that were designed to reduce their severity. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2018, SB 620 gave judges discretion to strike certain firearm enhancements. And in this graph, we see that the counts of admissions with firearm enhancements represented by the blue bars has dipped since SB 620 went into effect, most notably in 2020 at the onset of the pandemic. However, the overall share of admissions impacted by firearm enhancements represented by the yellow line has remained relatively stable. And so in here and in forthcoming graphs, we also label SB 81, which was recommended by the committee and made effective in 2022, and it granted the court's discretion to strike um, any enhancement. Uh, next slide, please. So as we saw in the previous slide, it does appear the overall number of admissions with firearm enhancements has decreased slightly since the reform went into effect. However, here we see a notable increase in the shares of the less serious firearm enhancement, PC122.5, represented by the light blue bars. And so the shares of PC122.5 increased from 52% in 2017, the year before uh, the SB622 reform, to 67% in 2022. There was a corresponding decrease in the 1020 life gun enhancement represented by the dark blue bars from 44% in 2017 to approximately 31% in 2022. Can we, I'm sorry to interrupt, can we tell um, our people, sir, I mean, I understand that people are being sentenced under different um, penal code sections. Can we tell if people are serving less time under the enhancement or being sentenced to less time? That's what we're obviously most concerned about. Yeah, that's something we haven't looked into yet, but we do have plans to look into that as well. Okay. You know, I'm also, this is Justice, I'm also wondering if the, uh, you know, decrease in the uh, 1020 
and the increase in the 3410 as a result of plea bargaining. That is, maybe the facts would, would support, you know, active use. But rather than uh, alleging that, they or, or they plea bargain down to a lesser enhancement, gun enhancement. Is there any way of knowing that? Yeah, we do see that in the data, and that's something yeah. that we're going to focus on, I think, in our future research. Okay. All right. Yeah. And the yellow bar here um, includes admissions with both firearm enhancements. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2019, SB 1393 gave judges discretion to strike nickel priors. And since the reform went into effect, we see that both the counts of admissions and the shares of admissions with a nickel prior have notably dipped with the decline persisting to 2022. So in 2022, only 1.7% of admissions had a nickel prior relative to about 4.5% of admissions in 2018, which was the year before SB 1393 went into effect. So this is just to make sure I'm following this correctly. When, when I did my very rough green, yellow, and red, and uh, well, not red, but anyway, a dark yellow a chart as to what's working and what's underperforming, we would say that this is a reform that seems to have been having a significant impact, uh, SB 1393, whereas the gun enhancement, maybe not, or the jury's still out. Is that what you're essentially concluding here? So I don't think we're determining causality by any of these reforms. That's something I think we're going to look into future, future work in. I think we're just kind of here looking at the correlation between um, these policy reforms and um, admissions that have these enhancements over time. I, appre I appreciate your caution, but let me just make sure I'm, though, I understand you're not attributing anything to causality. You're saying following the nickel prior, that's that one, there has been a change, whether or not it's causative or not. I assume, I see or hear that you're reserving judgment on that. There seems to have been some change. Whereas with the gun reforms, there appears to be not as much of a change. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I think in the the number of admissions with the nickel prior, it's decreased um, sizably more relative to those with the firearm enhancements. Yes. Okay. Well, and Mr. Chair, with, with respect to the question, I think one of the tough things for this committee's work and the time frame that we've existed is there were some rather large external factors that impacted the criminal legal system, specifically in that 2020, 2021 years that make it difficult, um, that make it difficult to suggest causality, but it does look from the drop that this is, it's at least very, very highly correlated, uh, which is pretty cool. Sure. And, and we, you know, we rely on the CPL folks in order to try, try to narrow down to the causality. Whereas the gun one, as you'll remember from a couple of slides ago, that yeah. one seemed to go back up after 2020. So I, I'm looking at the same thing. All right, sorry, continue, Amir. Yeah, so I was just gonna um, end with, yeah. So 1.7% of admissions had a nickel prior again in 2022 relative to 4.5% of the admissions in in 2018 again, which was the year before SB 1393 was effective. Uh, next slide, please. And so lastly, we're taking a look at AB 333, which was also a committee recommendation that became effective in 2022. And AB 333 created restrictions on how gang enhancements and gang offenses can be proven. So even prior to the reform, it looks like the use of gang enhancements and gang felonies was already generally declining since 2015. However, the drop in the share of admissions the year that AB 333 went into effect was larger than in prior years. So we see in 2022, only 1.3% of admissions had a gang enhancement and or gang offense relative to 2.1% of admissions in the year prior to reform. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Steve to wrap us up. Thank you, Omer. Uh, so uh, 
That was a, a great presentation. And um, it's interesting to see what's happened in recent years with admissions and to back up even a little further to see what's happening to the incarceration rate in the state overall and preview what we're going to be working on in our next report. So if we go back to 2000 prior to the, the wave of reform of the past decade, the state uh, was 14th in the nation in terms of our, the, our number of prison inmates per 100,000. And if we fast forward to 2021, which is when this, this graph ends, we're down to uh, 36. So a lot of the reforms that have happened in the state have, have kind of fundamentally altered uh, the size and the nature of corrections in California. Now, what, what is interesting uh, and something that we'll be focusing on in future reports is the, the distribution of these changes ac across different groups. So the two figures you're looking at, the top uh, line is showing the incarceration rate for African-Americans per 100,000 residents, followed by American Indian, Hispanic, white, and Asian PI, uh, which are the, the race categories that are used in the national prisoner statistics. And on the left, we're looking at California, and on the right, we're looking at the rest of the United States. And we can see that prior to realignment, we actually had very, very, very high incarceration rates relative to you know, the average for the other 49 uh, for, for African Americans in particular, and perhaps more comparable for uh, other groups. But these differences have narrowed quite a bit. It's still the case that California has um, uh, sort of slightly higher than average rates for, for um, African Americans uh, relative to the rest of the United States, but the disparities relative to the rest of the country and relative to other groups have narrowed. So in, in the future report, and hopefully we'll, we will present this at a, at a subsequent meeting, we'd like to decompose, first of all, understanding why the rates and these differentials were so high in the early, uh, in the earlier period, this call it perhaps the pre-reform period, and then try to pin down the contribution of realignment, the contribution of enhancement reform, the contribution of Prop 47, 57, and so on and so forth to the patterns that uh, we're observing here. So we're about to engage in a, in a sort of decades long forensic exercise where um, hopefully we will be able to speak more specifically to not only the effects of the, the changes in sentencing practices on the overall population, but how it's impacting our different communities in the state. And that's it for me. Thank, thank you, team. Uh, this is super interesting and helpful. Senator Skinner. Yes, I'm curious when you are doing a deeper dive to look at, for example, um, and I'm not sure, you know, if this is if you'll have data that allow you, but in seeing the gun, uh, we saw that uh, one type of gun um, enhancement was lowered, but the others rose. So <clears throat> I'm curious, did it happen that courts were substituting the other gun enhancements for the one that re was reduced? You know, did that, is there a direct correlation between the increase in the other ones and that decrease? Uh, that was one of my questions I thought would be interested to see. And then um, some of the uh, bill changes, for example, the nickel prior, well, Actually, I don't want to assert because I can't remember, but a couple of the changes that we did by statute around enhancements were these, you know, these don't happen anymore. Others were discretion. And what I would love to see is that did the discretion, did the areas where we gave discretion have little to no change and only the areas where it was more, more of a mandate with perhaps a few off ramps. So we, we looked at that briefly with committee staff. Let me just jump in to answer the question quickly. Although with the reservation that CPL is not interested in causation, both of the, um, the nickel prior and the gun, the nickel prior one was the one which we seem to have an effect and the gun is the one where we seem to not have the effect. Both of them are discretionary. So we were thought, we were thinking like, oh yes, we should think more about discretionary versus mandatory. But the, it appears, at least, that the nickel prior reform seems to have a lot of, had a significant effect, 
and it's purely discretionary. By the same token, the gun one is also discretionary and appears at least preliminarily not to have had the same effect. So I think we need to think about that a little bit harder, but that was a sort of confounding result. Well, I mean, the evidence does suggest move towards the less severe enhancement. So in that sense, I mean, one, one thing, yeah, one thing we could potentially look into is whether the average enhancement years associated with uh, uh, the use of a gun has changed with the legislation. And so even though the total cases might not, not change that much, it might be that the total years does. Right. That's that's Certainly true. That, that's that's what we I think we care more about than rather than it's under this section or that section. So, you know, has the time changed? Mm -hmm. Other I mean, I, I think that the sorry the, the suggestion that it hasn't had the same kind of impact I think is is bared out in a recent assembly um, committee analysis because we we had some folks introduce legislation trying to repeal that change already. Um, and I think part of the argument is you're trying to repeal something that actually hasn't changed the use of enhancements um, based on the committee analysis. So it's it's definitely something to look into, you know, if it's had any other kind of impact. And um, for the CPL team, obviously, we're also very concerned with uh, public safety. And is there is it just too much to ask to think to be able to be able to isolate? I know that. Let me pause for a second. I know that you did an excellent report last year on the impact of public safety regarding the three strikes law. Now that for there you had almost twenty five years worth of data. Is there a chance that we're going to? Are we ever going to be able to sort of do a similar analysis on a more quicker time frame about the public safety impact on any of these changes, if any? Well, I, uh, one possibility might be to make use of the fact that there's this enormous variation across counties in in sentencing practices and and again just to, to caution a little bit that we don't really you know we haven't done a deep dive into what the sources of those changes are or or if the general pattern is but we could imagine that that some counties might have seen bigger decreases in the use of sentencing enhancements than the other the gun enhancement or whatever whatever enhancement we you know one would choose to look at for the reform and we could do a, a comparison of the counties that that really um, deeply cut their use of that particular enhancement relative to those that didn't. And I think, it, was I think that, that would be super interesting because remember, I mean, at least the way that I've articulated and I'm just speaking for myself now, you know, the sweet spot of the sweetest spot that we're looking for is both reducing incarceration, finding reforms that reduce incarceration and either don't affect or improve public safety at the same time. Right. Um, so if, you know, incarceration goes way down, but as a result, public safety also goes down. That's something that we want to be at least aware of and vice versa. Um, so I think that those would be super helpful. And I don't think I said that your report on the three strikes law, just to make sure that it's on the record, was that it had no impact one way or another, as far as you could tell, on uh, public safety in California. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. So, so uh, in terms of our three strikes analysis, for the most part, what we're seeing is that the declines in crime that occurred in California, starting in the mid to late 1990s, also occurred in states that had similar um, crime levels beforehand, especially for violent crime, they kind of map right on top of one another. Um, so they, it, it does appear that, that, you know, indeed, there were large crime clients in the state associated with that with that particular form or associated in time, but that they occurred in places that didn't pass those laws as well. Right. Um, all right, I do wanna keep us moving, but does anybody have any final questions for the CPL team? Well, all right. Thank you for having us. Thank you all, thank you for coming yet again. It's good to see you again, Steve and Omer and Molly, thank you. I know that you're gonna be continuing working with us. So I look forward to seeing you again. So thanks, thanks to everybody. Okay. All right, just to keep things moving. Um, we're now gonna hear from additional witnesses and I'd like to e thank each of them in advance for sharing their insights with the committee today. Um, as usual, each panelist um, we'll have five minutes to make opening remarks and we'll reserve the rest of the time for Q&A. If you've submitted something in writing to us, please, please be aware that we've read it, we've considered it. And really, if you could reserve your comments to 
um, pointing us to the highlights. Um, because really the conversation is the, be the best part in the Q&A. Uh, our first witness today is uh, Judge Daniel Yelp Lowenthal from the Los Angeles Superior Court. He'll give us a view from the bench on how some of the laws that we've just discussed have been interpreted by judges and the effects that they've had on the day-to-day -day work in criminal cases. I'll also note that Judge Lowenthal was one of our very first witnesses in the committee back in April 2020. And it's a pleasure to have, have him back. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Judge Lowenthal. Please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. And um, it, I, I just want to first circle back and tell you, um, after I appeared in front of the committee three years ago, I think it was April 2020. Um, well, during that meeting, I had the opportunity to discuss with you a proposal to confer judges with discretion to grant diversion in almost all misdemeanor cases. Uh, the committee was um, very emphatic in its support. Um, Following the committee meeting, Senator Skinner and Assemblyman Ting introduced and got a bill enacted. It went into effect January 1st of 2021. It hasn't yet been in effect long enough for us to do a longitudinal study and provide you with um, completed results. But all of the anecdotal data suggests that the statute has been a phenomenal success. Um, thousands um, of people have participated and have used the statute to avoid the barriers and stigma that would have been um, caused had they been traditionally prosecuted. Recidivism is negligible and far lower than those who are traditionally prosecuted. Um, diversion completion rates appear to exceed 95% with participants routinely earning GEDs, enrolling in college or completing um, job training programs. And perhaps most importantly, it's improving racial equity in our system. It's keeping people who live in the over-policed and over-surveilled communities, who are of course the most likely to get cited and swept into the system in the first place, out of the system. So I'm extraordinarily grateful to the committee and uh, to Senator Skinner for breathing life into the proposal. Today, rather than touch upon um, the ameliorative uh, sentencing um, statutes. I think you have so many other panelists that can probably more capably do that. I just want to touch on the concept of further extending judicial discretion in sentencing, um, but this time by conferring judges with discretion to resentence. I think in general, it's fair to state that courts do a really good job of resolving um, backward looking events like trials. Um, but sentencing determinations required a forward-looking prediction of an offender's um, likelihood to recidivate, um, and it's much more difficult for courts, even for the best judges, to get right. And, and that's especially true because long sentences don't age well. Evolving norms off, um, generally will um, uh, render a proportionate prison sentence of one time period disproportionate in the next, and evidence often emerges after sentencing of an inmate's rehabilitated character. Um, and these dynamics require, I believe, that courts be conferred with the discretion to resentence. Um, and of course, that discretion is most acutely needed for um, inmates who were, who were sentenced in the decades following the Determinate Sentencing Act when we moved away from rehabilitation and issued draconianly long sentences that clearly were not grounded in public safety. So many of those individuals have been left behind and are still there and, um, and need to be heard. I absolutely applaud CDCR for using their discretion in 1172.1 to recommend some inmates for resentencing. I, I think from what I read in the background material that it's about 2000 over the last four years, which is several hundred of the last, in each of the last several years. Um, that's great, but it's clearly inadequate the courts have not received enough CDCR recommendations. The, parenthetically, the courts have familiarity with all aspects of an inmate's case. We receive a steady barrage of letters, of motions, of petitions. Um, we review the case, we know the case. We're also familiar with the um, rehabilitative progress a person is making. So we should not have to wait for a CDCR recommendation um, in order to calendar um, a matter for a resentencing consideration. The only arguments I've heard in opposition um, to providing judges with the discretion to resentence, one is um, a potential workload burden to the courts. I, I firmly disagree with that. 
Um, resentencing hearings require very little time, and the de minimis amount of time they do require is far outweighed by the um, moral and financial value to the state in correcting unjust sentences. And then the only other argument would be somehow we need to protect this concept of finality. Um, but I think we need to acknowledge that sentence finality is far different than judgment finality. There are sound policy reasons for protecting judgment finality. The cost of retrying a case, uh, the inherent difficulty in retrying a case after many years and, and victims needed closure. But sentence finality does not implicate any of those concerns. So logistically, I, I suggest there are two ways to proceed. First, you could allow all inmates after 15 years or whatever period you specify um, of imprisonment, the, the right to petition to have their sentences reviewed. And then the second option is just to confer judges in 1172.1 with um, wide latitude, complete discretion to calendar cases they think appropriate for sentencing, uh, resentencing consideration. Um, thank you for all of the fabulous work you've done. Thank you, Judge Lowenthal. Um, so a couple, I, I'm going to start off. Uh, first of all, I, I think that you're right, that the number one uh, concern that we hear about this type of second look, judicial discretion, resentencing, is the, the, the volume, the workload issue. And I share your instinct that, you know, are we afraid of too much justice, as was the Supreme Court once once put it, right? There is, I think to, to deny that there would be an increased workload is probably um, incorrect, right? There would be an increased workload. How to deal with that? And one of the things that I'd like to for us to consider as a committee is how we might be able to create um, a process, not only for this type of second look, but all types of uh, resentencing procedures, because there isn't really a, a single code or a set of procedures that anybody follows, appointment of counsel, documents from different agencies, and that kind of thing that I think could, could greatly help in that process. Mm -hmm. I guess two questions, uh, I'm going to ask you three three part questions. First of all, are there specific processes do you think that we could, um, that the state could enact that we should recommend in order to make the process go more smoothly, not just for the universal second look sentencing or however you want to describe it that you discussed. Number two is um, how there are existing cases. There, are, as you and I have spoken about, there are hundreds, if not more, of pending existing cases in the queue, as it were, before judges right now that are just not being heard. How do we get those cases? Um, and then number three- <laughs> Oh, go ahead. And number three is, Right now, today, there is, I believe, a CDCR regulation that allows judges to make recommendations to CDCR, admittedly not to themselves, to get uh, to request resentencing. My impression is and my sus suspicion is that judges don't know about this regulation at all, and if they did, aren't, aren't interested. So, what process can we use? What do we do about the current cases that are stuck in the caseload? And is th and does this regulation mean anything? Maybe should we should just codify it. So, so as far as the process, I think um, by um, codifying a, the judge's discretion to be in, under eleven seventy two point one, just to eliminate simply strike out that one hundred within one hundred and twenty days after sentence. Uh, I think that solves everything. I think providing CDCR with additional funding um, to meaningfully look back. And not just, I, I think my, my sense is that CDCR's focus is recommending people for resentencing um, where sentencing laws have changed and not looking during the last 40 years from 19, late 70s, early 80s until 2015, during, during that period of excess, not looking for what were um, irrationally long sentences. They were legal sentences, but they were irrationally long. They didn't serve any uh, public uh, safety purpose. So providing funding for them to uh, meaningfully examine all of the sentences. Um, as far as pending cases, um, are you grouping all of them together, the 1172.1 CDCR and DA recommendations and the SB 483 cases? The DA cases honestly seem to get the attention of the courts. There, and there aren't that many of them. We're going to hear a presentation about that, that the volume there is just not there. 
But in the other cases, yes, there does seem to be a backlog, both in the CDCR referrals and um, other sentencing referrals. The DA initiated cases seem to get everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. My impression. You, you, you know, um, I think the, um, the most effective way would be to have a resentencing court in which the process was streamlined and there is uh, one court perhaps either downtown or one court in every um, district. Well, I'm just talking about LA now. Um, but a resentencing court throughout every county that would really, um, that would not let these fall through the cracks. And then you would also have appointed counsel that um, know what they're doing and have consistency. And, um, and I think all of these would be meaningfully addressed. Perfect. Uh, uh, so the number then, Isaac, sorry. To, oh, yeah. I just wanted to, excuse me for interrupting. Okay. I just wanted to also briefly indicate that you're absolutely right about that CDCR recommendation. I understand from the background material, it's only been utilized in four instances. I don't think any judges have any familiarity with that regulation. I did not have any until Jennifer Hansen uh, shared it with me a couple of weeks ago. Um, there, there's not um, adequate communication between the bench and CDCR. No judges know of that recommendation. Um, judges aren't even aware of the new um, conduct credit guidelines. Um, or the fact that CDCR has such a strong um, desire for us on the bench not to sentence people in murder cases, for instance, to 50 to life. They want us to sentence to 25 to life to give inmates hope. Um, and, and none of that's been shared, though. I've heard that directly from them. So perhaps some kind of MCLE for the bench put on by CDCR would be very helpful. I would love to help facilitate that. Uh, Assembly Member Brian, you're over here on my screen. That's why I'm pointing you. Yeah. Well, first, Judge Lowenthal, t twice in one week. I don't know yeah. how I got that lucky. I uh, I asked Josh which one of you was older, and he hasn't talked to me since. So oh, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's it's good to see you again. I think when I hear you suggest something like we should give CDCR more money to then go for themselves, decide who may be needing resentencing. That gives me great pause because I'm concerned we won't get the bang for our buck, right? I think any anytime they can come to us asking for more money and put something righteous in with it, my fear is that we'll load them up. We won't get the recommendations we expect. You know, we're, you were suggesting now 2,000 over four years um, is is good, but not nearly not nearly enough, right? And so I don't know if the the gap is a funding gap, and so I'm a little hesitant with that, but I am interested in kind of the resentencing court that you were talking about. Because um, in, in thinking about that additional capacity, I respectfully have the same concern with judges, right? If we loaded the courts up with additional resources would the, and gave the judges um, complete discretion to review and resentencing, will we get the desired outcome? But this idea of having kind of a, a separate court entity that we could give resources to that has the sole mission of resentencing and reviewing cases, that's that's interesting to me. So wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that or, or the contrast between those three different ideas that you're that you're balancing. Yeah, I, I think that it's something that I've spoken to Chair Romano about. Um, I think it is um, it would in fact be the most effective way of getting all petitions processed. It would not solve the um, the, the first problem I mentioned is that judges right now don't have the discretion to calendar. Um, cases for reconsideration um, of resentencing without a DA or CDCR recommendation. And again, I have so many um, cases with which I'm familiar, people who are serving sentences that are just not ground in public safety, um, that, that, that have no business being um, in, in CDC are. And so um, it doesn't solve that, but the resentencing court would streamline all of the pending 1172.1 cases um, and they would be heard expeditiously um, and fairly and consistently. As, as you know, you know, judges all have different philosophical bents and perspectives. And what um, one, the same person's case might be um, resentencing might be granted one court and denied in another. So a centralized court, I think, would provide consistency and fairness as well. This is a, this is a tough one. We've had we've. We, many cat, some counties have had centralized judges, some haven't. I, I think that's another thing that we could post to CPL. We could always kick things to CPL about like, you know, what has actually been 
uh, work most effectively. I do, I do share your instinct that it would be at least efficient and consistent. Um, so uh, do we have one last, we have time for one last question if anybody has anything for the judge. Judge, you and I could go on forever. So I'm gonna let Senator Skinner have the last word. Yeah, go ahead, Senator Skinner. Good to see you, Judge Lonthal, and thank you, you for um, a very optimistic report. We obviously like to hear that, you know, the work we're doing and the work you're doing is having results. Um, <clears throat> have you had conversations with uh, other courts in other parts of the state about this idea of, I know that um, some of us have talked about, excuse me, in the past, mm -hmm. but it um, there was a concern I think that judicial counsel, and I don't want to speak for them because we never, no one ever put it forward really, but uh, that they, that they would have to budget for it and would potentially uh, ex distract or, excuse me, um, take resources away mm -hmm. from the existing courts. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of the issues. And then another issue was, uh, well, just wondering how, how uh, wide of a conversation you or others may have had. I have not spoken with people in other counties. Um, I am aware and I'm, I'm appreciative of the Judicial Council's um, concern about the burden on, on resources. But I will just point out that um, sometimes, in my experience, they overestimate what the workload burden is going to be. In the Judicial um, Diversion Bill that you um, wrote, for instance, they, they filed formal opposition indicating that it was going to cost the courts $9.6 million a year in increased burden. It's, it's cost zero a year. There, there aren't any increased burdens. So sometimes they tend to overestimate. Uh, I agree with Chair Romano, there, there would be um, some imposition, um, but I don't think it's as drastic as perhaps they're indicating. Thank you very much, Judge. Um, as I said, I could go on and on with you. With, uh, we have a, but we have a busy schedule. I really do appreciate your ongoing contributions and thinking about all these issues, and we will certainly be in touch. No good deed goes unpunished. Thank you. You all take care. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. All right. I'm going to move on to our first uh, true panel, which is about the Racial Justice Act. Um, which was a groundbreaking and really significant law that became effective in 2021. Racial Justice Act was intended to correct sentences and convictions uh, affected by racial bias. I mean, pretty straightforward, um, but it's new and there's been a lot of questions about its implementation that have yet to be resolved as we'll explore with our panelists today. Um, Tom, can you promote the panelists? Thanks. Nope. Well, let me, let me introduce everyone as uh, uh, Professor Chen gets started. Uh, first, we have Professor Colleen Ch Chien. Is that my pronouncing your name correctly? from Santa Clara Law School, uh, Michael Furman, who's the Chief Assistant District Attorney from San Bernardino, Allison Rosenmayer, who's a Deputy Public Defender from San, Wa San Joaquin County, and Evan Kulak, am I, pronounce, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, who's a Deputy Public Defender at the Alternate Defender's Office in Contra Costa County. So if I did mispronounce your name, I apologize, and if you would correct uh, me as, as we go. And uh, Professor Chien, if you would take it away. Great, thank you so much. It's really a privilege to be here today. I'm gonna to talk about data and the California Racial Justice Act. And I'll be speaking on behalf of an initiative I founded called the Paper Prisons Initiative. Um, and what we do at that initiative is address the gap between eligibility and delivery of relief from the criminal justice system provided under the law. So we've typically looked at expungements, resentencing, reenfranchisement, but we're also looking now at the California Racial Justice Act. And that's because we see a gap between the act as um, enacted on the law, the law in the books, and the very few cases that have actually been brought under it. So um, a lot of other people are, are, are contributed to this work. I'm not gonna read all their names, but I wanna acknowledge them and that this is a, a, a large a team effort. Um, and I want to talk about sort of how we've gotten to this point with respect to the RJA and kind of the evolution of the law that brought us to the RJA and its amendment in the fall of 22. I want to talk about the one published case and what it sort of says about the escalating burdens of proof. I want to talk a little bit about the North Carolina and Kentucky RJAs to kind of put the California exercise in context and then talk a little bit about how to support good cause, which is the standard for discovery with data and how the paper prisons initiatives plans to do that. 
So I want to first start with the Constitution, equal protection, and sort of the high watermark with respect to equal protection, which was the Yikwo versus Hopkins case. I'm not to go into it in detail, but suffice it to say, we had about 150 people arrested for violating a laundry ordinance, uh, but all of the Chinese applicants were denied permits to continuing to continue operating their laundries. Only one non-Chinese applicant was denied. And so the Supreme Court in this case said, though the law itself be fair on its face, denial of equal justice is still within the prohibition of the constitution. So there can be an equal protection violation. We fast forward to uh, McCluskey versus Kemp, which was sort of the precursor to the RJA, where the majority there on the basis of racial disparity information in the death penalty said basically that these disparities are an inevitable part of our system. And the, the dissent basically said, well, this kind of statement really seems to suggest a fear of too much justice. So that brings us to the California RJA and this sort of idea that racial justice is out there, it's there, but it persists because courts only can address it in its most extreme and blatant forms. So I'm not gonna go into all the findings of legislative intent, but I think they're important to keep in mind that the real intent was to create a way now to through A3 and A4 claims a create a way to look at whether or not there are patterns of disparity that might be actionable. And the 22 amendments sort of doubled down on this commitment by making the act retroactive and sort of and making more inclusive the types of evidence that could be uh, out there. The findings of legislative intent not only say that it's important that we make these, uh, these disparities actionable, but we wanna make sure we can get the evidence to prove that there might be disparities. And so what we see in the Young versus Solano case, the one published decision is this kind of what is called by just, uh, Judge Streeter, this escalating burdens of proof. To actually just get to discovery, you just need good cause. The other levels of, uh, of relief need more. So I wanna just kind of briefly, again, allude to what has happened with these other RJAs um, in the past and you know, sort of give us a little bit of context because we still are in very early days with the California RJA. And so the Kentucky and North Carolina RJAs, I think give two examples of one, on one hand, too little justice where the act has not been used at all. And then on another hand, perhaps too much justice where the act was used so much that it actually led to the act being repealed. So, um, you know, again, we only have that one decision uh, on the California side. So I am you know, sort of taking a minute to look at these other uh, ex examples. So in 98, uh, Kentucky decided to go forward with their RJA, and over this 25-year period since then, it's only been used a handful of times. Now, why is this? Because this high evidentiary burden that has been put forward by the RJA just cannot be met by the data that is actually available. There's no systematic collection of data, which is unlike in California where we have great data. Um, and there was also a sense that this had limited success. Prosecutors were actually leveling up rather than leveling down death sentencing. We contrast this with the North Carolina example, which was enacted in 2009, also covered death penalty cases, but it was repealed after four years. And what happened there was there was reliance on a single study from the Michigan State University that showed these disparate impacts, and these cases were very successful. Prosecutors came in and advocated for the repeal of the law because they said that this was basically a quagmire in the courts and was cost prohibitive. So where do we go from there? Well, in this particular case, uh, paper prisons is looking at this good cause standard and what does that, how do we satisfy that? Again, so far, I think we've been in the realm of not being able to be able to show this too much because of a lack of data. We are working on a tool that will actually show uh, and provide data that can potentially support good cause. Uh, and that's something just to look for in the future. We're not yet approved by the California DOJ to do this. Thank you. That's five minutes. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it was no, timely. I was going to say, wow, not only was that a lot of information, but you were like right on five minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a lot of questions for you, but let's continue on. Uh, Mr. Furman, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Good afternoon. Sorry, Michael Furman, um, uh, Chief Assistant to Attorney in San Marino County. I know that you may have a lot of questions, uh, uh, Chair Romano. Um, I was um, requested by um, some of your staff to potentially join. Uh, I, I got a call last week to be a part of this uh, committee hearing, and I was happy to do that. Um, I thought that uh, it was probably more uh, more beneficial for me to use the time to answer the questions that you may have, to address the issues that you may have. Um, I'm honored, certainly, to be here to talk to you. Sure. That was even better than five minutes, or quicker than five minutes. Um, uh, Allison Ro Rosenmeyer. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, so yeah, so I'm Allie Rosenmeyer. I'm the Racial Justice Act Attorney for the San Joaquin County Public Defender Office. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to focus my time on the hurdles that the defense community has been facing in bringing specifically statistical disparity claims under the Racial Justice Act, because as it's currently written, we are facing a series of difficulties in even being able to bring these claims. So the first difficulty we've encountered is gathering any sort of county level data to begin with. And so sometimes that's a technical problem because counties might not just have uh, case management systems that can produce the data we're looking for. Sometimes it's a statutory problem. Uh, we are usually using the Public Records Act to request this data, um, but often those requests are denied under penal code sections 13300. Uh, and so forth, uh, which limits what data can be disclosed and to who and prescribes penalties for improperly disclosing data. So a lot of entities we're requesting data from are resistant to providing it. Uh, we are hopeful that the bill that recently passed, AB 2418, which imposes data collection requirements on DAs may eventually be useful in the future, but it doesn't go into effect until 2027. And we'll still need years worth of data after that to establish any disparities. So it won't be useful probably until the 2030s. Um, and I'll also note that there's no mechanism for enforcement that I'm aware of in the act. So if offices are not collecting and reporting that data, there's kind of nothing we can do about it. Um, but even where we are able to gather data and establish that there is some sort of pattern of disparities, the requirement that we then compare our client's case to similarly situated cases is where we have really hit a wall. Um, in many instances, there are few if no similarly situated cases to compare to given the historical patterns of policing and the definition of crime, or it's very difficult if not impossible for us to identify or even for the DA's office to identify who could have been charged with the crime but wasn't. Um, and so we're left kind of trying to prove a negative. And I'll also note, as written, the Racial Justice Act doesn't address systemic disparities in policing or arrests, which is really where we see the source of disparities in the justice system beginning. But then, even if there is a comparison pool, the next difficulty is the burden imposed both on DA offices to produce years worth of discovery so that we can make that similarly situated analysis, and then the burden imposed on defenders to analyze years worth of data. This requires an expert, which requires funding, and it can take weeks or usually months, months and months of analysis to read 10 years worth of crime reports and make comparisons. And many clients are being held in custody and they do not have the time to wait for this discovery process to unfold for the slim chance at potential relief after this kind of three step months long process, especially clients charged with low level crimes. Their cases just move too fast to bring RJA claims in. But finally, even if we can get data, we can establish a comparison pool, we can get the discovery, the similarly situated analysis leaves, there's a lot of unanswered questions uh, based on the statute. And I think we're predicting that's where most cases are really going to get bogged down in court in litigating the details of what is similar enough, uh, how many cases are required to compare to, at what point are we required to make this similarly situated comparison? Judges are requiring in the few cases where this has been brought so far, they're requiring that showing at the prima facie stage and denying cases for not having enough comparisons or not similar enough comparisons. And another big question is, do all the cases in the pool that we are analyzing to establish that statistical disparity, do those all have to be similarly situated because that significantly changes the data? And the statute leaves a lot up to interpretation. There's a lot of terms that are not defined. And it's been our experience across the state that judges are interpreting the law in the manner most stringent and most burdensome to the defense, instead of embracing what we see as the spirit of the RJ and the legislative findings to acknowledge and address systemic racism. So 
Our recommendation is to delete the similarly situated requirement, which would actually throw the door open to meaningful, broad RJA litigation, would make bringing claims less burdensome, less lengthy, and time consuming for all involved, and allow them to bring claims in a broader number of cases. Until then, these claims are just going to be few and far between. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kulik, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, yes, it's Evan Kulik. Kulik. Hi. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor to be speaking with you all today. Um, I'm hoping to give a little bit of real world practical application of the Racial Justice Act uh, from my practice in Contra Costa County. Um, I will start by noting that you know, in Contra Costa County, uh, District Attorney Dinah Becton's office has been quite cooperative in terms of providing data through Public Records Act requests, and um, it truly has been a county by county huge disparity of who's been able to get data that actually has race and ethnicity information, um, where case numbers or names are turned over or not. So we have been fortunate enough to to have access, and and um, DA Becton has really allowed her office to open up their information um, to us. Um, so my uh, Racial Justice Act case that um, has gotten quite a bit of attention was the Gary Bryant case in which um, the Superior Court judge who actually had heard the trial in 2017 um, then heard our post-conviction challenge uh, that we brought starting in 2021. This was a heavy lift. Um, dozens of pages of briefing, um, thousands of pages of academic articles that were reviewed and relied upon. Um, it took a year and a half from the initial filing of the motion through the discovery motions, the Public Records Act requests, the Prima Fascia case, the evidentiary hearings involving four witnesses. Um, that alone took a year. And then finally getting the judge's decision. So um, as Ali mentioned, uh, low-level cases don't have the time with clients sitting in, in custody to, to do the litigation this requires. So it's uh, notable that you know both my cases I'll be talking about today are, are homicide cases um, where we're able to, to bring this litigation. So in Mr. Bryant's uh, case, uh, ultimately uh, the judge found that there was uh, racially discriminatory coded language uh, invoking implicit bias through the prosecutor's use of slang terminology uh, in cross-examining my client and in closing argument. Um, the language of the Racial Justice Act that, that had that section that discussed whether the, um, the speaker, the prosecutor, is repeating relevant uh, terms used by a witness was critical in our case because the prosecutor introduced the slang terminology in the first instance. He was not repeating witness testimony. And um, he was using each of those slang terms to discuss violence, uh, dishonesty um, by black men. So it was the, the context of the slang and the repeated use. And then the second portion was the introduction of rap uh, lyrics, rap videos um, against our clients uh, by the gang uh, detective, the, the expert for the prosecution, uh, purportedly as evidence that our clients were, were gang members and prone to violence. And um, through uh, extensive hearings where we presented social science research, uh, we were able to establish that um, the interpretation in this way relies on negative stereotypes and invokes negative stereotypes um, that the public have about rap music and about um, black men and the way that those build upon one another. Um, the legislature passing AB 2799 at the end of last year came right at the time as our hearings were wrapping up. And I think um, that really solidified for our judge that the arguments we were making were, were founded. Um, and in fact, the legislature's uh, citation to the research done by one of our expert witnesses that we presented in our hearing um, really cemented that. I would note that the experts for these Racial Justice Act challenges are nationwide and they are working in very specific areas, you know, finding the right person to be an expert on the particular type of implicit bias that occurs in a trial is tough. And fortunately, because of COVID rules, the experts 
were able to testify via Zoom uh, in my case, but it would be a, you know, a real concern if the changed uh, rules of court uh, would prevent that. Um, so the, the second case, and I can get into this uh, more in q and if people are interested, but um, basically I, I am in the process of a statistical disparity challenge regarding gang murder cases, who's charged with uh, life with parole and who's charged with life with no possibility of parole or LWAP. And, and we've seen a racial disparity in our county where black defendants accused of gang related murder are more likely to be charged uh, with a format that carries potential LWAP. All right, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, Professor Chien, uh, can I start with you? Um, it seems, I, I'm curious if in the other states, um, they had um, similar issues without, with proving the racial disparity um, claim or not. And if you can, if there are lessons to be drawn from those states and the way that it's being rolled out in California. I understand that the politics might be one thing, but let's put the politics aside for a second, just on the operation of the statute. Um, I think that these, you know, precursors, you know, teach us uh, a little bit, you know, because there are death penalty cases and, um, you know, they're, they're limited and, you know, the, the statutory language is different. I don't think we can necessarily sort of map their experiences completely onto ours. Uh, but I do see improvements in what we're doing as compared to the previous um, example. So if we, with, with respect to Kentucky, for example, that was the, the place where they still have the RJ on the books, but it's just not being used because of the lack of systemic data. So again, in California, we have great data that's been collected by the California Department of Justice, at least at, as a starting point. And I think it's a matter of now making sure that gets liberated so that it can be used to understand both by DAs and by uh, public defenders, just to show, well, what, what are the patterns of disparities that are out there? Um, and so I think as the California Department of Justice blesses the in increased um, dissemination of that information, we can avoid that mistake or that problem in the Kentucky RJA. Now, with respect to North Carolina, um, I think there is this kind of question that has been raised, which I think we'll need to confront here, which the public defenders have, have raised in their testimony about the expense of actually, even if you have the data uh, initially, that might not be that expensive. But then in terms of getting to satisfy similarly situated and same conduct, uh, that you know creates this huge um, discovery, you know, intensive uh, bit of information and having to be examined by both sides. So that's an open question. I think why the prosecutors were successful in advocating for the repeal of the North Carolina RJA is because they were able to persuasively argue that this created, uh, you know, a, a quagmire in the courts and was cost prohibitive. And again, I don't, I'm not an expert on this. We are only trying to, you know, trying to intuit what we can from the public record. So I can't attest to whether those are even completely true. But I can see and imagine if Ali's comments, you know, would sort of scale that to every single case where we find a disparity, you know, that could cause challenges. So um, I think that, you know, trying to figure out what are the, um, you know, what, what needs to be proven and then what, what kind of outcomes could you get to would be a potential way forward, right? Because partly it's a question of what is the what is the relief that's provided, right? If it's just you know, a good cause, we just want to get information. Okay, that's one thing. Once you have information and you're trying to then meet the prima facie um, standard to get to a trial court hearing and then get an approve a violation and get a remedy specific to the violation, these are all, you know, one case by case specific things, but when we're talking about systemic patterns of disparity, perhaps what we really need to be seeing are, you know, structural remedies that go towards the, the operation of that, uh, you know, that, that unit and some sort of continued monitoring and not just something that's about a one off in a case, but really is about trying to understand what is the overall pattern there and how is this potentially impacting public safety as well as, um, you know, the racial disparities in the system. So, you know, that is, you know, a, a blue sky academic kind of answer because that's not what the law says. Right. But I do think that if we wanted to get a work to a workable place, we're saying we're talking about systemic patterns of disparity. We shouldn't really be talking about overturning every single case um, that, you know, might fall into that pattern. We should be talking about systemic um, remedies as well. Right. And I, and I appreciate that. So, and like one of, I think, our intentions of this committee is to sort of help translate some of the academic aspirations to real world practice and, you know, have a conversation between them both. So, Ms. Rosemary, because you, you, you brought this up, is the data 
does the DOJ, California DOJ, does anybody have the data that we have that you do that that we need to litigate this case? Does it I exist? think that entities do have this data, but I don't think that as written, we are entitled to it, like county level public defenders. I mean, there's a lot of statewide reports that come out, right, but just, it requires county. And you believe the data, you believe the data, and you believe the data is owned by DOJ. Who else? I, think, I mean, I think DOJ has some or district that, attorneys. I think um, judicial counsel does. Judicial counsel puts out a report analyzing statewide trends in felony dispositions. So they have some, but I've asked them for data just for San Joaquin County, but they've said they can't provide it. So there's data out there. Okay, Mr. Furman, do you, let's just start with you. And as Assembly Member Brian, I think that you were going there. Do you collect, do you have the the data. It seems like that's the first starting point. Is that right, Professor Chen, that we need the data, right? Because as far as you know, do you either have the data or does the Department of Justice have the data that we're talking about? So the data that I think is relevant to um, uh, uh, the Racial Justice Act, um, I don't believe that uh, the data that the uh, Department of Justice has is complete. I don't believe that uh, many of the DA's offices have structures in place to be able to collect that data. I can speak to the fact that it is something of interest that some of the DA's offices, including our own, uh, want to try to find manners in which we can collect that data. Um, it is not currently within the infrastructure that many of the offices have. Um, and it, this is, I, I say that coming from this perspective, unlike kind of the prosecutors in the other states that uh, Professor Chen has spoken to, I am not someone who is an advocate for any uh, repeal of the Racial Justice Act. Um, as a person of color, I think that, um, and in when I was in law school at Edmondson versus Leesville Cement was the most recent iteration of uh, the Supreme Court speaking to the fact that racism was used uh, in jury selection in civil matters, and it was only invalidated in 1992 when I was in law school. And so for me, that is problematic. And so when I when we saw the passage of 745 and subsequently um, the modification to have it retroactive to all cases, I think uh, there's great value in making sure that um, defendants are treated fairly, that they are not discriminated discriminated against based on the race, ethnicity, or national origin. I see it as one of the Precious Code Section 67.60 70.5. But I want to be clear, I don't think that every office has that data. I do think it behooves every office to work to collect that data. Uh, I can tell you as uh, an executive for my office, it's something we want to do for a lot of reasons. Is we it, it, The obligation is to us also to make sure that we aren't treating defendants uh, unfairly. And so we should be somewhat introspective. I don't think the issue that uh, 745 seeks to address is political. It is about ensuring that justice is done for every litigant. And, and that includes a defendant, that includes a victim. It, we, we need to make sure that that happens. I don't believe the data in the manner that I think that may be helpful uh, to my colleagues uh, with the Public Defender's Office uh, and um, uh, private defense bar are available. Even to us, I, I think that it's a difficult way in which we have to create that data but I do think it's a necessary thing. And I do think it's something that we as an organization or as a state should look at to make sure that that data is collected because the manner in which we, that material is submitted to the Department of Justice, whether especially arrest information, they don't have all the information that I think that would be relevant under 745 that I think would be helpful to making the comparative analysis that uh, Ms. Rosenmeyer spoke to. Um, Assembly Member Brian, I see your, your hand raised, uh, Professor. Um, but Ms. Uh, Assembly Member Brian, did you have a question or comment? One, a, a little bit of both. Um, Ali, in, incredible. I think, you know, the Racial Justice Act has, has gone into legislation once and then additional legislation to try to clean up some of this. Um, and, and so I think pointing out the flaws in implementation is really helpful for us as legislators because we often, after it's signed into law, I think we did the job. Um, but I think there's a there's a lot more that has to go on here. Um, the questions about data collection, I think it, definitely something that we need to, to talk about, whether the data, um, as Mr. Furman has mentioned, whether it's not there and we should be collecting it, um, or whether it is there because you're seeing it aggregated in other places. 
and all of those places drew that data from an initial local source. I think the struggles in the PRA uh, between different jurisdictions raises the question for me because you cited a penal code that that stops that that local jurisdictions are using to deny a PRA request. Um, that Chair Romano sounds like a revision to the penal code might need to be made or an, an exception at least to allow for kind of clear transfer of stuff that would be relevant to the racial justice act. See, I I concur. Uh, <laughs> Professor Chen, do you have insight here? Yeah, I just want to slightly disagree with the uh, idea that we don't have the data that's not there um, as to just the first good cause showing that's needed. So, um, you know, that does not require substantive violation, right? So we're talking about similarly situated, same conduct, same county. That Those are certainly needed for 745 C and e, uh, D, C and E. But just to get discovery, you just need good cause. And so I think that is a more generous and liberal standard. And I'll go ahead and sort of point to, um, you know, a tool that's out there that's terrific from the California data, the Burns Institute, it's called the State of Disparities. And this is youth data. And um, we're trying to create something similar with the California Department of Justice adult data. We already are sort of in process with them, but they are able to show at different points what the disparities are. Um, and they're able to do it at the county level. They're able to control for whether there was priors or not. And the data is in the system. We are blessed in California to have it. And again, it's not going to be enough to control for a lot of the factors that actually matter, right? For wobblers, whether there's a gun at the scene or their knife or, you know, other things are going to matter that are not captured in this kind of gross data that the California Department of Justice has. But to get to good cause, just to get to discovery, um, you know, I would say that we actually have more data than we might have had, had access to historically. And again, at the Paper Prisons Initiative, we're trying to create the similar tool um, and it'll be available potentially if we're, we get our approval from the California Department of Justice. Okay, so just to, to summarize what you just said, you think the California Justice has enough data at least for the uh, good cause stage of proceedings? Just the data exists? I think there is, there is relevant data, yeah. All right, All right. Um, Mr. Furman. I'm, I'm making reference to, um, uh, Ms. Rosenmeyer's statement related to the, uh, the acquisition of statistical evidence under 745A3. Uh, I think that that was the, I think Dr. Chin's talking about a different phase of the Racial Justice Act. I'm referring to the statistical evidence that is necessary to establish that a prosecution was more frequently sought or obtained victims for more serious, uh, convictions for more serious offenses against people who share the defendant's race, ethnicity, national origin, in a county where the convictions were sought or obtained. That's a very unique, and there are different aspects to that that I think uh, are not collected and should be collected. Uh, and so I, 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 I am agreeing with Ms. Rosenmeyer that, that there is some difficulty with trying to get that specific type of data. Uh, I'm not speaking as to A1 or A2, but specifically as to A3 uh, and enforcement there, because I think when I heard from uh, um, both of my colleagues, uh, that was where they felt that there was some difficulty. And I okay, I so excuse excuse my ignorance, and we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but this is important. So, Professor Chin, can you can you just respond to that? So, yeah, and I think the best thing to do is to read um, Judge Streeter's decision in Solano versus Young because well, can in, we just do it right right now without reading the decision? So, oh yeah, so I I um, I think for discovery. You don't need to prove a violation. So all the A3, A4 elements do, you do need not to have, need to do you need, so, Sorry to interrupt. For discovery, you don't need a violation. I, I get that. You just need right. to show good cause. But do you need to show enough similarly situated? Is there sufficient data to provide, provide to meet the similarly situated? You don't need to. You don't need that for, in my opinion, for good cause. Uh, Ms. Rosemayer, do you agree? Not as written in this statute, but the reality in the courtroom is different. So for instance, I had a case, this is just how it plays out. I had a case where there had been a sting operation and it resulted in an arrest rate of 70% Hispanic individuals in a county that has a 40% Hispanic population. And so I brought a discovery motion um, asking for records from the, the sheriff and the DA and the judge denied that motion because I didn't have anything to show why 70% arrest rate is disproportionate besides comparing it to the county population. I 
I had walked into that hearing with the assumption that an arrest rate that's almost double the local population is inherently problematic, but that's not how it was interpreted. And that's how judges are interpreting this law in the courtroom. Mr. Kulik, Kulik is, would you concur with that? I mean, are, are, are we in the, so I guess my question is, to put too fine a point on it, this committee could put a significant amount of energy into asking for more transparency, of data, actually more collection data and or more transparency of data. We can certainly do that. I guess my question is, it, do we agree, is there consensus that that would be a significant improvement first next step? Or Professor Chan, I'm, I'm hearing from you that maybe we already have the, the data. So first, Mr. Kulik, you've been quiet, so I just want to put it to you. Do you agree that it's, we need more, can you just answer this question again? Is there, is this really that we need more data or is there sufficient data to at least make it to the first um, step? So I, and think I understand that Contra Costa County, you're maybe a special case, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think because it is so varied county to county, uh, I think the data needed exists and the DOJ has it. And the DOJ does release that type of data to bona fide research bodies and academic institutions. There is already a mechanism. So we, you know, we do have a yearly report from the Judicial Council that looks at sentencing disparities by race um, based on DOJ data. Uh, that data that they're relying on is considered offender confidential data, can't be released. Public defenders don't get access uh, to that type of data. And so I think a, a fix here, uh, sort of in line with what Ali was suggesting, was that public defenders' uh, offices be able to be treated uh, the same way as the, the bona fide research body or academic institution uh, to get access to the DOJ data, you know, under the same requirements of, of keeping individual offender information uh, confidential. Uh, and uh, am I correct that it's the is what's the are the is the charging data the most important information? Is that do, do they have that as far as you understand? Ch charging data is generally not the problem. Uh, the the question that we're really facing is is arrest data because when we're tasked to show our clients overcharged, we need to identify the people who could have been charged like our client, but were not, and that comes from uh, arrest data. And you say that that exists. Oh, DOJ has that, absolutely. Mr. Furman? There are multiple data sets that I think we need to talk about for effective uh, evaluation of, of the Racial Justice Act. It's not just arrest data, uh, but it's also arrest data in similarly situated instances, right? And and the way 745 is written is it's, it also looks at disparities, not just in the charging, but also in the disposition and sentencing. So why I think it's hard, so let me give you kind of a real world example of where it might be difficult, right? If you have a, a robbery under penal code section 211, okay? You could have people that are arrested under that. You could equally have people arrested under 47C, grand theft person. Uh, you could have, and, and those should be probably looked at very similarly, but you can have people charged, arrested and charged with 211 who then get reduced to 47C. Uh, which is a reduction of a of a robbery to a grand theft person, a non-strike offense. But the problem is, is how do you how do we make sure that we could see all of that? Who got reduced? And so you have to actually figure out, okay, who was originally charged, but who was originally arrested, what they were charged for, and then if there was a reduction. Uh, and if there was a reduction, what was the sentence? For example, was the sentence in most instances state prison for the two eleven versus? Uh, maybe probation on a 487C, and the race of the particular person at issue there, okay? And I think when I look, when I read 745 to try to make sure that we follow uh, what it seeks, you also have to look in that instance potentially at the race of the victim in all of those instances. And to that area, uh, Chiromano, I don't believe that data exists, but it should. Which it part does adequately it Which to, part does it in terms of that that play of a case that as it goes through uh, in a situation where someone is arrested for one thing, charged with one thing, reduction, that's not that might not get captured as currently in the attorney general's uh, in the DOJ's materials at present. All that will show is they got arrested for this. There was a disposition for this. But you're not going to capture kind of that process where there's a reduction. Well, um, 
And I think that we should. So it has a couple, we have a couple of the steps, but maybe not all of them. Tom, I know that you work a lot with the um, DOJ data. So can you shed some insight onto what they have and what, where the blocks might be? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is is right and everyone is wrong at the same time, <laughs> in a way, which is why this is so complex. Um, you know, I'll go back even a little bit further. So right now, the arrest data we have is a format from the 20s, and there has been a shift to try to get it updated to something called NIBRS, and I hate to bring in the acronyms. And, you know, if we have that, then we'll have a lot of the information that, that Mr. Furman is talking about, about each offense that happens. And I think that is going to be a key thing to get to the similarly situated. So if we're able to get that information about arrests, that will be key. Now, getting that into the hands of practitioners is a whole other issue. I think even if DOJ wanted to give it, there's just technical infrastructure issues that we've learned a lot about working with the California Policy Lab about what you do with it. It's an overwhelming amount of information. Um, and then, right, so, so then you have who's arrested. And then you do want to know what decision is a, is a prosecutor making. And that charging information is, you know, in the first instance, going to be held by DA's offices. And what we've learned, very different formats. You know, you have very, you know, relatively sophisticated case management systems, like in, in some offices and other places, you know, for lack of a better word, you have like an Excel spreadsheet and, and you know, a staff that doesn't know how to export, doesn't know how to do inquiries on it. And it's, it's just a capability issue. So you want to know the charging decision, but you also want to know, you know, people who get diversion or other outcomes. And luckily, the prosecutor data bill that uh, Ms. Rosenmayer talked about is going to capture all that. But there's two main hurdles. One, it doesn't go into effect, as she said, for basically a decade. And that's assuming there's funding for it. The way the bill was written was it's in the law. And until there's funding, it, it's, you know, sort of sitting there. So, you know, and of course, I'm sure there's going to be years and all kind of roadblocks and actually getting that data in a way that's apples to apples and incomparable. But if, you know, sort of we had the NIBRS data on arrest, if we had the prosecutor uh, justice data on charging and, and outcomes, I think that would answer a lot of like, what data do we need to take a claim from discovery to a hearing to a final disposition? And of course, there'll be fights along the way about who gets it and what it means and, and all that. But that's sort of more of a legal question than this first question of, you know, are we even talking about, you know, the same um, information here? So it's immensely complex. And I think uh, it, if you sort of look at the way the laws are right now, it seems like we should have a lot of it. But as we're hearing about when that, you know, translates away from uh, the, the penal code, it gets a little bit different. But of course, then the overarching question is, and what do we do in individual cases about this stuff? Mr. Furman? Yeah, so, and I thank you, Tom, for talking about the NIBRS data. The, the problem also with the data that uh, is required under statute that um, uh, law enforcement has to now collect, there isn't a connection between that, right? Because we, even we don't get the information that a law enforcement agency submits to the DOJ. So there's no way actually for us, and we should be, if we really want this to be effective, you would want to be able to see, okay, from that individual, what happens to that case? Because you don't get that. All you do is just get the raw data of the arrest information and the information that they collect, but there's no connection to the case that they submit to us. Uh, in fact, when we speak to law enforcement agencies, they tell us we're not required to give you that. We, we inquired, hey, would you be open to giving that to us as part of what you provide to us in criminal discovery? We actually even asked that when, when uh, I think it was uh, AB 956 started. Uh, and the answer was, we're not required to. DOJ doesn't require to do that. And so there's this disconnect, which I think is a hurdle. I think that for us to get the right data, and I, I come from this perspective, I, I don't think any of us, um, I, I think that we, we I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say as a prosecutor, I do want to make sure we're not violating the law. I do want to make sure we are treating everyone fairly that we're not treating someone unfairly based by uh, on their race, ethnicity, and national origin. Uh, and so for us, I do think that you would want to have some connection so that we can have that evaluation done be between from the time of arrest all the way through the time of sentencing. I think we all share that. And Ms. Rosemary, I want to get to you. I, I want to we only have a couple of minutes left. I want to try to sort of narrow down to a very specific way that we might be able to solve some of this problem here. I was one, I was hope I'm hoping you're going in that direction. So Go ahead. Not exactly, but I did want to respond to a couple of the points that have come up. I mean, I, I, I want to illustrate the complexities of this, honestly. Um, so when we talk about the data, 
that looks so different from county to county. So Evan's been able to get pretty detailed data from his county, from ours. I, I was able to get after eight months and the ACLU and a law firm getting involved, a spreadsheet of every case referred to the DA's office and filed by the DA's office over the last decade. That only has principal charges. It doesn't have enhancements. It doesn't have special circumstances. It doesn't have sentencing information. And I've talked to their IT person and they're just not capable of producing that. And I believe them because our system is not capable of producing that in our office either. But so that's our county and other people I've talked to in other counties, okay. they can't even get charging information. Okay, so is a good question. Okay. But so <laughs> the, the larger point I wanted to make is that data is just the beginning of the process that just gets us into the door um, where we can begin to have the conversation but there's so much after that and i i want to kind of reiterate professor sheehan's response that this is a systemic problem that we've now put on um, that's supposed to be fixed through individual cases and it's it's a very burdensome process and as as written we're not going to have it we're not going to see a systemic solution uh, no, I appreciate that. And as this committee has tried to address many of the systemic problems with race um, in the justice system in, in other contexts. And I understood and I appreciate and I wrote down even that there seems to be an incredible burden put on line DAs, line public defenders to do incredibly complicated um, civil rights litigation, right? That's that. Yeah, it's way above our pay grade, honestly. Right. Which is not honestly what you guys are experts in. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you know, we could take it out of your hands. We could say that this is not your responsibility and shouldn't be litigated by you in the first instance. I don't think that, that we would necessarily want that. We could make it easier. It seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, that the data, getting the data is the very first step. Um, tell me I'm wrong and we'll concentrate in another area, but it seems to be consensus that there is a problem getting the data, that we need the data even before we start talking about these other issues about burdens of proof and and um, discovery issues and, and experts and remote testimony and all those business pieces, which I understand are important, but it seems that, does anybody disagree that we should be concentrating on getting the data? Is anybody... is is there any disagreement on that? I, I don't. I don't disagree. But if if we have um, judges uh, finding that no case is similarly situated to any other case, then it's meaningless, and that is the position that prosecutors are taking. That is their defense against the Racial Justice Act. Um, is nit you know basically nitpicking, finding minor discrepancies. So. In my in my case in Contra Costa County, where we've a clear racial disparity of overcharging special circumstances on black defense and gang cases, where 70 percent of people admitted to CDCR for LWAP for gang cases are black out of Contra Costa with a less than 10 percent black population. I, I don't want to litigate the cases here. And we, again, we have limited time. I guess, so, so, we, so we message loud and clear on the data part, and we will focus on that and get back to everybody on trying to to. Un unlock some of that. On the similarly situated, which seems to be another issue that's that seems to be coming up, Rose, uh, Ms. Rosemary, you suggested cutting it all together. The idea of similarly situated is not un unique to the Racial Justice Act, right? This, been, this has been litigated for you know decades and decades and decades in state and federal courts. Is there a fix that, I mean, one fix could be taking it out altogether, as you suggested. Mr. Kulik, are you suggesting something else? Or are you saying that that's the that's the best fix? Uh, I I agree. I think that's the the best fix um, when you have a a clear uh, pattern of disparity. Um, that you know that should be enough when you can point to my client is charged, you know, more seriously than uh, such percentage of people of all other races, and there's this history. Um, then going through, I mean, the, the amount of work is hundreds of hours to scour the facts of each case. Um, this case I'm litigating, there's only 90 gang murder cases, and that is taking, you know, many, many hours. So it, it, it becomes unworkable to go through a factual analysis of every single case in our, for the statistical challenge. Um, and uh, a argument between the parties of whether each of those cases fits a similarly situated or not, it's, it's unworkable and will never 
I don't think will ever result in um, a, a victory if judges apply as narrowly this factual debate on the similar situated uh, points that the DA's offices across the state seem to be pushing forward. Professor Chin, I'm gonna give you the, the last word on this. I wonder if you have, I'm hoping you have some insights here, right? We can't say that uh, the, that in California, there's a uh, racially disparate, there's too many, there's way more black people than other um, uh, people being you know, sent to prison. So therefore, because my client is black, he doesn't get prosecuted ever, right? That there needs to be some apples to apples comparison. I was wondering if you have insights as maybe from other jurisdictions or thoughts on how to address this problem of the similarly situated. We have, we're putting the data problem to this slide for a second. I mean, it would, the only thing I'd probably can offer is that it's easier to operationalize similarly situated with respect to criminal history. So you could look at, you know, first offenses, or you could look at people with one prior conviction or something. But in small counties, it's going to be a problem. I think there needs to be a little flexibility because once we start making cuts like that, then the numbers get really small. Um, if you want to stick to only the last 10 years, you don't want to like put the last 30 years of data. So we need to have a little give in the system, I think, um, from that perspective, you know, every little um, additional thing we impose, uh, you know, is going to make the data smaller, less reliable from that perspective. So, but I think we could operationalize something like, let's look at everybody where it's their first offense and if there's still a pattern there, that's even more convincing. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I, I'm not sure I can comment on a All right. All right. easy fix, sorry. Are there other members of the committee that have questions? I've dominated the Q and A as usual. All right, Here, here's where I think we're left and, and we're gonna, continue this conversation amongst ourselves with the committee, and I'm sure reach back out to you. I think that there's almost universal agreement of the spirit of the Racial Justice Act, right? That we don't want to incarcerate, to arrest, convict, or sentence people based on their color, their skin, national heritage, right? How to prove that, how to litigate, those are turning out to be very complicated questions, probably more complicated than anybody really uh, imagined. And um, how can we as a committee help facilitate that litigation in a way that's fair and efficient? Um, and I think that that's a challenge for the state um, and for the legislature to help figure that out. It seems that at, at minimum, better data, better access to data is a minimum first step. And then there are some of these procedural steps about similarly situated um, that seem to be kind of the next uh, legislative step. And we'll continue to try to think about ways that um, we can make recommendations along those lines. Um, thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Like I said, we're gonna continue to chew on this and uh, reach back out to you. I have no doubt that we will try to make a recommendation along these lines. Um, so um, thank you all. I really do appreciate um, your time and your insights. All right. With that said, I do want to keep us on schedule, but I also want to take a break. So um, let's take a five minute break here and reconvene um, at three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>